together. Uh, team, we have uh, Michelle Heffern, Bill Anderson here, Susan George could not be here. All the planning and work, I want to thank our host. I want to thank our sponsors. I'm going to go through. We have, it does not happen without sponsorship. And uh, May TNT, we have Kevin Hanna. I think he's here. I didn't see Kevin before, but I think we have, hopefully Kevin will come. RG, we have uh, two leaders here, Joe Rizzo and Veronica Dasher are both here. I want to thank them both for support. <laughs> Charter Communications, we have Mark Mayerhoff from Charter. I want to thank Mark for support. Also, we have Katie Orch, uh, who cannot, she's in New York City, she could not come, but we get to do these things because of our great sponsors. I want to thank all our sponsors for taking time to do that. It really makes us possible, and we are really proud to have this event. Uh, we have a, a great speaker um, tonight. I just want to say before I leave, or before I, I end up introducing him, uh, I have a very important family event tonight that I, I have to get to. So I'm going to be here until about 525, 530 and slip out. So I'm not leaving for any lack of interest. We had lunch today, and I think we have a great speaker. Uh, but I'm married uh, 33 years. I'm make number 34, so I have to be there. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a, uh, our speaker today. We had uh, a, a great lunch. Uh, Neil Bradley is here. He is Executive Vice President and Chief Policy Officer at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, a very important, very powerful figure in D.C. for our business interests really around the country. I, I'll read his bio so you get a chance to get a uh, sense who he is. Neil spent two decades working directly with Congressional Committee chairpersons and other high-ranking policymakers to achieve solutions. At the U.S. Chamber, he is responsible for aligning the organization's overall policy priorities and advocacy efforts. He oversees several major policy divisions within the Chamber, including Cyber Intelligence and Security Division, Economic Policy Division, Employment Policy Division, and Small Business Policy Division, Healthcare Policy, Transportation, Infrastructure Policy, and Environmental Affairs and Sustainability are also under his leadership. Before joining the Chamber, Neil was president of Chartwell Policy Solutions, a research analysis and advisory firm focused on public policy issues. Neil spent uh, nearly 20 years working in the House of Representatives of Congress, including 11 years working for the House Republican leadership. While working on Capitol Hill, he was regularly named uh, roll calls list of the 50 top congressional staffers. He's a graduate of Georgetown University, which did beat Syracuse every now and in basketball, I'm sorry to say. Uh, sorry, Neil. Uh, and resides in, in D.C. with his family. But he, uh, uh, a very powerful figure in the business community. We are proud to be uh, a chamber, be affiliated with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and be a member. Uh, but I'd love to have a discussion at lunch. Neil's going to talk for a few minutes, and love to have a question and answer. We talk about everything today, workforce development, uh, the hearings of the Kavanaugh hearings, you name it, the whole breadth. Uh, he has a lot of in-depth knowledge, a lot of relations, a lot of connectivity, and uh, again, a, a great speaker, very well-versed, and very happy to have him. And before I, I do uh, have him speak, we have a little gift for him. Uh, it's nice having our chair of the board be a CEO of Constellation. Very nice. So we have yes. uh, we'll give the wine. But thank you. I want to welcome you and thank him for making time to come here and welcome to the Rochester. Thank you, Bob. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks, Bob. Let me tell you how excited we are uh, at the U.S. Chamber to actually be affiliated um, with the Greater Rochester Chamber. Um, a lot of people, you know, Washington's big, and everyone thinks it's runs around and tries to do good things and often screws it up and does bad things. The reality of the U.S. Chamber is, is we exist as a function of state and local chambers. Um, the state and local chambers all across the country actually precede the U.S. Chamber. We're 106 years old, but a lot of state and local chambers are a lot older. And in fact, we were founded at the request of President Taft, uh, who said that all these local chambers come in all the time to Washington to, to talk to the administration or talk to the Hill. We need a place to help them organize and get together. And uh, President Taft asked those business leaders to form the chamber with two goals, to represent the business community and help the government. And those are the same two goals that we have today. And we could not do that without the partnership that we have uh, with folks like Bob and state and local chambers all over the um, I, I'm here at a, a pretty good moment in our economy and public policy. I was very pleased to walk in and uh, see on the sign that the, the theme is policy matters. Um, because uh, as the chief policy officer at the U.S. Chamber, uh, part of my job is really believing that policy matters. And it does matter. And I think we're seeing that today in our economy. Uh, you know, we spent uh, 10 years, uh, up until this current year, uh, doing something that had never been done before in the history of the United States. And it's not a positive thing. We spent 10 years at sub 3% economic growth, which violated all the historic norms for the United States. 
And some people say, well, you know, we averaged about 2% economic growth. You know, what's the difference between 2% and the 3.1% that had been the average in post-World War II America? And the difference is huge. The difference between 3% and 2% is 50%. Um, and when you think about the, what it means to a person, it's even bigger. You know, the great promise of America has always been that each generation is going to be better off than the generation before. The idea that our kids are going to have it better off than we do, that we have it better off than our parents did, our parents better off than our grandparents did. That's all driven by economic growth. The idea that income can roughly double every generation. And at 3% economic growth, that's exactly what happens. At about every 24 years, the economy per person doubles uh, at 3%. If you're growing at 2%, it takes about 35 years. And you have that fundamental breakdown in the idea that in a generation, we can be better off than the generation before. The good news is, is we just completed a quarter of 4% growth. Our economists at the US Chamber think that we'll end the year at above 3%. And we're positioning ourselves to grow even faster in the future. There's a lot of pent-up demand after a decade of subpar economic growth, but it's also because policy has made the difference. Uh, the first comprehensive tax reform bill um, in over three decades that was enacted at the end of last year that has really unleashed a lot of capital investment. It's brought back money from overseas. It's finally taken the U.S. from the least competitive developed economy internationally in terms of its tax code to right around the middle and one of the best. You combine that with our intellectual property, our workforce, our rule of law, and it really positions us to compete better than anyone else around the globe for international talent, for investments, uh, for new manufacturing, and for economic growth. Regulatory relief. Um, last year we hit, uh, we set a new record uh, for the first time in the history of measuring regulatory costs, regulatory costs actually went down at the federal level. Normally in any given year, um, we pile on two to three to five billion dollars in additional regulatory costs on the economy. By the way, that's on the prior years, two to three to five billion. On the year before that, two to three to five billion. Um, you all know the cumulative effect of those regulations in your businesses. <clears throat> For the first time, we went the other direction. And I suspect when we run the numbers at the end of this year, we'll conclude two years of actual reductions in regulatory costs. So we've got a lot of tailwinds that are helping propel our economy forward. And that's really great news, and we're seeing it in the economic growth numbers, we're seeing it in the stock market, we're seeing it in the unemployment rate. Uh, but we also have to be honest about the headwinds we face. And you know, we view part of our job the U.S. Chamber, and I'm sure this is true for Bob and his team as well, is it's not just uh, banking on your successes, it's figuring out what the next challenge is and confronting it and taking it on. At the federal level for us, the most uh, urgent challenge is this emerging trade war. Um, so uh, you all follow the news. Um, at the end of July, we'd imposed tariffs on about $75 billion worth of goods from China, Europe, Canada, Mexico, and a few other countries around the world. They had imposed $75 billion in retaliatory tariffs on our exports. You've seen what that's done to the farm economy. But for manufacturers who rely on steel and aluminum, you're seeing that in their input costs. You're beginning to see it in consumer costs. It's by far um, the uh, largest self-inflicted policy wound that we're currently facing. And it looks like those tariff levels are going to go up with the new announcement on China, which, by the way, we should come back to in a second because there's lots of problems with China that we do need to address, and a further escalation there. Um, you add it all up, and it's the highest level of tariffs that we've imposed uh, since smoot Holly and um, the Great Depression. Um, there were a lot of factors that led to the Great Depression, but a lockout of trade and tariffs were one of the causes and a precipitating effect of why the Depression went on for so long. Um, we're working feverishly uh, to encourage the administration to conclude a NAFTA agreement that includes Canada as well as Mexico. There's no way any agreement minus Canada would pass that would remove the tariffs that have been imposed on, on Mexico uh, and 
Canada and we'll level that playing field. We're encouraging further negotiations with Europe um, to resolve our trade disputes with Europe. And negotiations have started there, but they're a little too slow. Um, and with respect to China, we're urging the administration to take a different course in confronting the very real problem of intellectual property theft, for forced localization, and others. Our view is, is that the more quickly we can resolve these trade disputes, the more we can turn what is currently a headwind into the economy into potentially a, a, another tailwind as we modernize some of these trade agreements. But the second big headwind that we face is workforce. Um, I will tell you, we, uh, the Chamber, we, we travel all over the country. The single number one issue we hear from employers, irrespective of size, irrespective of industry, irrespective of regional location, is the inability to attract a skilled workforce to meet their current demands. And it used to be that it was, we can find workers, but we can't find workers with the right skills match for what we're hiring for. Increasingly, the problem is we can't find workers, period, even if we're going to train them, even if we're willing to pay to get them into a training program. And that's showing up in the national numbers, right? So we now currently have more uh, job openings in the United States than we have individuals who are looking for work. And that's pulling people off the sidelines, increasing the workforce participation rate moderately. But this is a long-term structural challenge. You know, we benefited post-World War II uh, because we had the baby boom generation coming into the workforce, and we had women in record numbers coming into the workforce. Right? We've achieved the, the, the entry of women into the workforce, and now baby boomers are retired. In fact, every day, 10,000 baby boomers reach retirement age. And it's going to be 10,000 baby mm -hmm. boomers reaching retirement mm -hmm. every day between now and the end of 2029. It's a huge change to our workforce. And we need to think about um, how we keep those individuals in the workforce longer um, so that they're contributing to our communities and to our economy. We need to think how we pull more people off the sidelines, particularly prime working age males who've been sidelined uh, because of drug addiction, incarceration, or, or other events in their lives and get them back into the workforce. And we have to have a common sense immigration platform that allows us to attract the skilled workers that we need. And skilled, by the way, isn't just high skilled. We need skilled workers in high skill, but we also need skilled workers in, in construction. We need individuals in agriculture. There's really no part of the economy that doesn't require more workers. Folks ask what our big priority is going to be, and they often ask in the context of what the election outcome might be um, this November, which I'm sure we'll get to in a second. Um, by far, it's workforce with immigration being part of that. And I'm actually optimistic that no matter what happens in November, um, whether uh, control of Congress remains the same, just with a different size majority, or control of Congress shifts from Republicans to Democrats, that there's an opportunity for the business community to drive common sense immigration and workforce development reform at the federal level. Um, that's got to be complemented by what you all are doing at the local level and at the state level. This has to truly be a partnership at all levels of government to make it work from skills training, um, K through 12 education at the local level, which Bob and, and several of us talked about at lunch today but also at the federal level with higher education reform, career and technical education reform, and immigration. And the reason I'm optimistic is that it's just not a choice anymore. Um, it's a requirement. And the more legislators that we talk to, Republican or Democrat, are beginning to see that, in part because they hear it from you all, and I think it's finally beginning to sink in, and that's going to overcome the political obstinance and polarization that we've had, um, we think, to hopefully get something done. A moment about politics, um, because it is that season and an even-numbered year. Uh, and then to, to your questions, comments, suggestions for us. Um, you know, the, from a business community standpoint, I think the biggest concern we have this election cycle, and, and frankly the last election cycle and going forward, is the hollowing out of the center and the polarization of both parties. Um, we need folks who are willing to set... Um, uh, the interest maybe of their political base, whether they're a Democrat or a Republican, aside to adopt some of these common sense things that we need to get done. It's a shame that tax reform wasn't bipartisan last year. It should have been. 
and Republicans should have figured out a way to make it bipartisan, and Democrats should have been willing to come along. It's a shame that trade has become partisan over the recent years. It used to be that the free trade movement uh, had opposition in both fringes of the political party and was supported by a vast middle. That's changed. It's a problem that immigration um, is largely supported by one party now. So a lot of what we're doing is, irrespective of the outcome, we're looking for candidates and elected officials who are committed to a pro-growth agenda and are willing to govern. One of the things that we're looking for this November is what, what's the agenda? Is the agenda continued regulatory relief? Is it relief for community banks in particular from Dodd-Frank regulations? We made some progress on that. There's a lot more work to be done. Is it immigration reform and skills and workforce? And the candidates who are willing to continue that pro-growth agenda are the candidates who are getting our support. I think it's going to be a long election night. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to turn out. Um, I feel like I go back and forth each day. I, the one thing I can say is I grew up in politics trusting polls. Don't feel like I can trust polls a lot anymore. Um, you all apparently feel the same way. Um, and you know that's a, that's a reflection of the fact that today the election outcome is largely dependent upon who shows up to vote. And polls are simply nothing more than a guess at what the electorate's going to look like on election day. And if you make the wrong assumption in your poll, you get the wrong outcome um, in terms of what happens in reality. We think the business community has an important role to play in who turns out on election day. Um, we tell our members, and, and I hope you'll consider doing this as well, is that it's inappropriate for business to tell, for employers to tell employees who to vote for. It's not inappropriate to tell them that elections matter, participating in the process matters, and they ought to show up and vote, and here's how you get registered, and here's how you make sure you find out your polling location, and here's how you go vote, and to think about the issues at stake. Um, you know, the reality is I was asked to uh, an interview with Capitol Knight today, they were asked, are you worried about turnout, the increased turnout on the Democratic side, given that we've endorsed a number of Republican candidates in this area? My response was, no, I'm not worried about increased turnout. I want turnout higher on both sides. The democracy does a lot better when more people participate in it. Our view is that people are motivating uh, a certain segment of voters with one message. Our job is to uh, motivate them with the message of what we think is at stake and let the best ideas prevail. And we think that the dividends of a pro-growth agenda are evident in what we've seen in the, in the past year or so. We think there's opportunity to build on it. So uh, let me stop there. There's so many more interesting things going on than what I talked about. Um, and hopefully you all have some questions, comments, or even advice for us on that. Yes, sir. Neil, Steve Barry, Bank of America. We yeah. had it on the way in. So welcome to Rochester. Thank Great you. To hear your perspective. And uh, really had a two-part question. Uh, it was interesting to hear the introduction that cybersecurity yeah. is under your umbrella. And on the banking side, we're seeing the pervasiveness of cyber attacks and the sophistication of fraud escalating. And with that, see that as a real threat, not, not just to small businesses, but an, an aggregate to the overall economy as a headwind. And so if you could address that. And, and then second of all, as far as infrastructure improvements, what, what you see in regards to those two. Great. Um, cyber security is a huge problem. It's not just big businesses or big institutions, small ones are facing all the time too, um, and, and whether that's an, an attack to actually gain meaningful information or market moving information, or ransomware. I mean, it's just a, you know, an attempt. Anybody can be ransomed. Think about the data all of you have, um, um, your business, and what you would do if you got locked out of all of it tomorrow. No wonder a lot of businesses are paying ransom um, to, to avoid things. Yeah, the question is, what do we do about it? And you know, the reality is, is that the private sector can't solve this on its own, and neither can the government. And so what we believe is that we need really a, a joint effort of the public sector and the private sector to tackle this. That means information sharing. Um, you know, folks uh, who are in a position who invest on the private side and combating cyber need to be able to share that information with the government when they see attacks happening, when they see the type of attacks. Government needs to be able to share with the private sector what they see going on. 
And then we need to get creative in the same way that we got creative after 9-11 about encouraging technological solutions. You know, we, we had these great revolutions post 9-11 the and the ability to uh, detect uh, chemical and bio weapons um, and things that we all see every day with the airport and then things we don't see a lot of times. Um, there's a lot of technology that can help in the cyber space. Government can help particularly with some liability protections to encourage the development of that and make it easier for businesses to deploy. So no questions of problem. The big thing we do, um, in addition to partnering with our larger employers, is with the small businesses doing an education series on how they can protect themselves from cyber attack and best practices. And, and the reality is, is that, you know, don't make your password password. Um, you know, um, you know, and a few things like that can make a big difference in actually, in actually protecting your systems. Uh, infrastructure. I feel like Lucy in the football with infrastructure, you know, eh, Obama, infrastructure, oops. Trump, we're going to have a big infrastructure, oops. Um, at some point we've got to fix, the, fix our infrastructure. It's not a question of, uh, it's just a question of when. Um, we do face a challenge about how to pay for it, and we ought to be honest about how to pay for it. You know, similarly, government can't just afford to, to put infrastructure on the credit card. We're going to need financing at the chamber. Uh, we're in favor of adjusting uh, the gas tax. hasn't been adjusted since 1993. It's lost 60% of its value uh, because of inflation and because we all drive more fuel-efficient vehicles today. So, it, And by the way, it means we're driving more. So we're using the roads more and we're paying less uh, for using them. So we have to have an adjustment there. And then when it comes to things like uh, ports, railways, airports, um, we have to do what Australia, the UK, a lot of the other in the speaking world has done, and that is encourage private investment uh, to come in and form public-private partnerships, which can really provide a lot of capital. There's a ton of capital in retirement and in sovereign wealth funds that is chasing returns, and they're not getting the returns out of treasuries and bonds today. And if you can put that money to work in infrastructure, dedicated streams of revenue, it's a huge opportunity to both bolster our retirement savings, but get the capital that we need today in the infrastructure. So we think there's a two-part plan there. I'm not terribly optimistic at the moment, unless the president decides after election day that, by God, I want this, and I'm going to cut a deal to make it happen. Because for it to happen, it's going to have to be a bipartisan deal, and he's got to decide that he wants that heading into 2020. So far, he hasn't. He hasn't made that choice. Neil, yes, I, I got two questions. One, one is on tariffs, and the other is on minimum wage. <clears throat> tariffs. Before Trump got into office, my understanding was that there was 1,100 or 1,200 tariffs already in place. I don't know what the extent of those were, how they compare to, you know, the current tariffs. And my second part, question is in regards to minimum wage. Um, Caesar Chavez. When he was the head of the uh, United Farm Workers back in the 50s and 60s, he was one of the big proponents against illegal immigration. And his philosophy was, for low-skilled jobs, the more illegal immigrants you have, or poor immigration policy, it creates an oversupply of low-income workers and therefore depresses wages. So he was one of the biggest opponents of illegal immigration, and uh, that's quite a change from today. What's your opinion of the unions who so seem to support illegal immigration and legalizing this situation, and, which really hurts their members for, most, for the most part, increases, increases the supply of labor, which diminishes the wage gap? So, um, start with tariffs. Um, we, even before the, the recent imposition of tariffs by, by President Trump, we collect in the single-digit billions of tariffs globally each year. Um, it's fairly low. Um, it's principally from countries that we don't have a free trade agreement with, or in some cases where we have a free trade agreement with that we've set some type of tariff levels. Um, you know, the, the, the famous example is... Uh, the, uh, in the 60s, uh, Johnson 
wanted to protect the U.S. Um, uh, light truck and uh, cargo van industry. We have a 25% tariff on all imports of trucks and light vans um, from around the globe that are, uh, and so we collect, we don't, that's by the way, one of the reasons you don't see a lot of foreign nameplate trucks or light vans, other than ones that are now built in the United States, but we collect some amount of tariffs from that. Um, we've taken single digits and, you know, we've gone to, well, we're, we're going to surpass a, a hundred billion um, in likely tariff collections. Now, by the way, we won't collect all that, right? Some of what's already happening is people are changing their supply chains and they're something that they used to import, but now it's a 25 or 10 percent tariff. They're looking at somewhere else that doesn't have a tariff. Um, and so that has a cost to it too, which by the way raises prices and creates inflation. So it's not a great revenue generator, but it's true we do have some level of tariffs. In terms of minimum wage and illegal immigration, uh, the Going, let's go back to kind of first principle of that. What drive, what, what sustains economic growth, right? So economic growth at its root core is efficiency, the ability to, to produce more with each hour of input, and people. Um, and, and, and so you actually need a growing population, a growing workforce to sustain economic growth in the same way that you need efficiency gains to make that workforce more, uh, more competitive and to raise living standards for everyone across the board. So I don't directly ascribe to the idea that more workers equals lower wages. Now, it's true that when you get from the macro into the micro, you can find some industries or you can find some localities when that's the, where, where that's the case. In the, the current labor environment, the current labor market, there's virtually no place where that's the case. I mean, go talk to uh, um, agriculture producers in, in the South or in the West. It's not a question of being able to pay people to pick produce out of the field. They can't get anyone to do it, period. Absent a, a migrant workforce that actually kind of moves from, from farm to farm. And so um, I, I don't ascribe to the idea that uh, more immigration is kind of a, ultimately, particularly in the place we are in the economy, a downward pressure. Um, in terms of where the unions are, the union dynamics changing a lot, right? And the model of what constitutes the union workforce is changing. So, interestingly, uh, we just had, I just had dinner with the head of Lyuna on, on Monday. One of the things that we have in common is we're very interested in uh, keeping the folks who have received temporary protected status. This is an immigration program from about 20 years ago. There's about 300,000 of them in the country. Why do they care? They're actually their members. These are construction workers who are principally in Washington and Florida, and, and they're their dues-paying members. We like them because it helps the construction companies and the economy. They like them because, because they're their members. Yes, sir? There's one area I think that we maybe missed the boat on as years went on. When I was growing up, the big thing was to get your education from high school and go to college, go to college. That was a big driver. Yeah. And the whole idea of the skilled trades was not really pushed years ago, at least. You know, electricians, plumbers, uh, mechanics, you know, all that stuff now is very complex. It's not like it used to be the old days. It's very skilled workers, as you say. And I don't think that we really made a push for people to go in that direction. Not everybody goes to college, as a potential to go to college. But I think that whole skilled, that skilled area is something that we should work on going forward. The more people trade like that. I could not agree with you more. Um, it's a huge and they're, they're, this, this problem's at multiple levels. You know, in some cases, it's us, right? Like, you know, let, let's be honest about it. it. You know, moms and dads, you know, who think, you know, who start every day with this is the pathway. Also goes to our schools, you know, school counselors. Also goes to the programs in, available in schools. We push VOTEC out of a lot of schools, particularly in the 1990s, where it's non-existent. Um, we've allowed a stigma to kind of take hold. We need to fight those things, right? And so one of the things we worked really hard on was to get a career and technical education bill passed that is focused on both high school and community college education um, exactly for that reason. We've actually been talking with the White House. So you got a bully pulpit. I uh, talking to Ivanka, actually. you got a bully pulpit. Uh, the government spends a lot of money on advertising for lots of different things. 
should we be talking about the value of these skilled trades jobs and promoting those as a yeah, Other countries path. do a little better job than us. I've seen that other countries, they really, you know. They're very trades. different. Germany is the, the poster child. Right. Very different model. Um, I suspect America would not go along with the German model at the end of the day uh, because it, it, it begins to look like, you know, you're about 10 years old and we've decided what you're going to be. Um, but, uh, but one of the most innovative things going on is the development of charter schools that are focused on all kinds of skills. And, and, and some of them are carpentry and, and mechanical schools. Some of them are coding, right? Um, so, some of them are human resources, right? Things that you don't need a college degree for, but you need a little bit of specialized training in. And the idea that, you know, maybe by the time you reach high school, you can go complete your high school degree in a charter school that gives you that kind of background and then have more options available to you is one that I think actually holds a lot of promise. And for whatever reason, those have less of a stigma attached to them than the, the vote ed program that was kind of siloed off, at least as it was in my high school. Yes, ma'am. Uh, going back to John's comment about the minimum wage, what would you say to folks who, because you see all of these The thing I worry most about with, with raising the minimum wage is actually what does it do for the unskilled labor who's brought into the labor market and employment at a price point that's currently below 15, right? And so, you know, it, at some point uh, you set a minimum wage, and, and listen, it's best set at the local level because you have the best determination of local workforce demands. The worst place to set it is at the federal level because $15 in New York City, I assume, looks a lot different than $15 in Rochester. I'm from Oklahoma. I'm from Sepulpa, Oklahoma. I guarantee you it looks a lot different there um, in terms of cost of living, the quality of life you have. But what do you do about those new entrants into the workforce? And do you make it more cost efficient for business to replace them with automation or simply to hire, not to hire the marginal worker who's not going to generate that level of return you know, uh, for the company? And so, you know, for a long time, even as we increased the minimum wage, we often had a, um, an entry point wage for uh, youth employment, right? So, so people in high school were trying to get that skills and were, and were getting trained. A lot of places are trying to move away from that. Um, I think that's a mistake because the best thing we could do for those individuals is get them into a job get them socialized with the idea of work, particularly those who are most at risk of not being employable. The best way to get them employable is to get them a job so that they understand what it's like to have to get up, show up on time, be presentable, ready for work. And you can't stick them in a classroom and teach them that. Sometimes you got to get them out into the workforce. And if we price them out of the labor market, those are the people we're going to end up hurting. Yes, sir? If there's a shortage of workers, are wages going to get bid up? They, yes, um, and they're starting to. Interestingly, if you look at the data, um, a lot of the pressure is actually going on the benefit side. So, you know, what happened to the, all the wage, what happened to the wage growth we should have seen in the past decade? A lot of it was eaten up with health care, right? So, yeah, I mean, you guys know this. From, from an employer perspective, you look at the cost of the employee. The cost of the employee is the all-in cost. It's not what you just pay them in, in W-2 wages, right? So um, if, if you're spending more on health care, that's money that they didn't get in, in, in their paycheck. Um, and by the way, workers value that. That's, that's why they want employer-provided health care, 401k match, or paid leave, or, you know, or all the other things. Um, what we've seen in the data for the first last eh, six to nine months is um, pay going into benefits, and in the last month it started to creep into wages. And we'll see if, if that, that's ultimately sustained. Um, the other thing, and, and this is why some of the statistics, at least in my opinion, you've got to be a little bit careful with, 
when you look at the statistics broadly, you're not taking into effect that there are a lot of changes in the demographics of the workforce. I mentioned 10,000 baby boomers retiring. Um, just invariably, older workers leaving, being replaced with younger workers, on net reduces total compensation, right? And so, how, a bunch of economists debate how much of how much of that is applying downward pressure, and it's actually not downward pressure. It's just the statistics don't know how to take into account um, that you know, someone who's 60 was making more than someone who comes in at 27. Uh, Bill Carpenter, I work with a local public transit agency and want to combine a couple of the topics, the infrastructure and make sure public transit is included in as a big problem there in the Highway Trust Fund. And then the demographics you've talked about and the difficulty finding labor, which people come to me regularly, Chris Reist and, Chris Reist and uh, Bob Duffy, Bill, can you get to these different locations? Uh, where do you see autonomous vehicles, other options, becoming publicly subsidized so that I've seen uh, three of our uh, $500,000 uh, limousines go by with not a lot of people on them because they only go where they go instead of where the jobs are and where people are trying to get to on a more customized basis the way people are used to using Uber and Lyft. So how do we generate more creativity in uh, the technology available for public transportation? funding levels, funding streams to support that? I think there's going to be such a revolution in personal transportation you know, in the next decade to, to 15 years. Um, I mean, it's already happening. Uh, you know, in Washington, um, ridership on, on the metro system, our, our subway system, um, is down. It's got some mechanical issues. They've had a lot of upkeep problems. Uh, but, but one of the reasons is Uber, Lyft, and increasingly, um, I haven't seen any here. You all don't have the, uh, the scooter, the electric scooters yet? They're not licensed in New York State. Well, we're going to catch up to the rest of the world. There, yeah, <laughs> we got a lot of them. And you see people zipping through everywhere on, on electric scooters. For a ride that you would have taken one to two metro stops, you know, assuming it's not raining, people jump on one of the, the electric scooters. So I think that's going to change the face of it a lot. There's obviously always going to be a role for, uh, for, for public transit as part of that. Um, but I also think it's going to disrupt car ownership um, and the whole models around car ownership. Um, the chairman of our board uh, at the U.S. Chamber is uh, Tom Wilson, who's the CEO of Allstate. They sell a lot of car insurance. Uh, he openly talks about how they're preparing for a world that looks really different. And it starts with people giving up their own cars um, because they're, they're using ride-hailing services and ultimately transition into a world of autonomous vehicles. Interestingly, this is a fun thing to think about that, what they went and did is they said, okay, well, what would avoiding car ownership save the average customer? Turns out it's a, a pretty decent chunk of change. Right? What are they going to do with that? And you know, the, the smart companies are saying that money is going to get spent somewhere. I'm going to be investing in whatever it is that that money is going to get get allocated to. So I didn't really answer your question because I'm not sure exactly what it looks like, other than saying it's going to look a lot different. Um, we think we need at the chamber. We think we need some basic rules of the road on autonomous vehicles. We don't need a patchwork of regulations in the same way if we'd had a patchwork of regulations in Henry Ford's day, we'd never had the Model T because every state would have had some different requirements for what the headlights look like and the tail lights and uh, that whole bazaar. We can't have that. Um, the other thing we have to do when we invest in infrastructure is make it compatible to that autonomous vehicle self initiated <coughs> travel world, which means 5G and it means everything's going to be wired, right? And um, that's going to cost more when we do the infrastructure investments, but it's going to pay off long term. Yes, sir. So, where do the tariffs at? Do you see, say, food prices going down because those will stay domestic, and do you see more manufacturing because people will find local, you know, in, in the United States stores? Um, so, let's start with food. 
Um, prices should and are at the moment going down. Uh, we have record levels of commodities in storage, um, a lot of cheese in storage, um, a lot of pork, a lot of beef, grains. That's depressing prices at the moment. That will, let's assume the tariffs remain in place and these are all on the retaliatory tariff side. That's going to come out of it because the, the, the farmers are losing money at these price points and they're not, you know, what they keep asking us is when's it going to end because we're deciding what we're going to plant and we're deciding how many heads of, of steer or, or swine that they're going to have and they're going to level it out because they're not going to keep losing money on this deal. Um, so it won't be a long sustained reduction in, in prices. Um, that will even out. On the manufacturing side, um, you know, it takes you know the, the president likes to talk about you know we have more steel plants open. He's right about that, right? Um, but the impact of the tariffs and so capacity is increasing in the United States. Um, but the price point has far exceeded the actual impact of the tariffs. So we're currently cold rolled steels. So we have a 25% tariff and prices are up 40%. So the price increases are exceeding the tariff levels. Um, and, and, and in that kind of environment, it's not a question of local sourcing. For the manufacturers, what they get worried about is their competition if they're manufacturing against someone abroad, because those manufacturers in Europe and Asia are not paying the US 40% premium. And so even if you relocate manufacturing here, if you are reliant on export markets, your foreign competitors are going to eat your lunch. Um, so you may have some manufacturing moving in. You're also going to have manufacturing moving out. It all depends on where your market is. If your market is wholly domestic, yeah, you'll locate here. If your market is around the world, you're going someplace else um, because otherwise you can't compete with your, your foreign competitors. So. It's a truly a, a, a mixed bag. And we talk to a lot of manufacturers who say if this continues, we'll move what production we have here overseas because 95% of consumers aren't Americans. And you know, they need to be selling to Chinese, they need to be selling to Indians um, in the Indian economy. Um, and interestingly, depending on what they make, if they don't make it in China, they can make it Vietnam with Chinese steel and sell it into the U.S. without a tariff, right? So in that kind of environment, you change your supply chain because then you don't lose your American customers and you gain all those customers in Asia. Big problem. That's why tariffs make no sense. Like No one ends up coming out on top of the tariff war. So how do we get out of it? We get out of it with Mexico and Canada with a new NAFTA deal, slowly with Europe with negotiations. China, this could be, this could go on for a long time um, and, and, until the economic pain is sufficient enough that, that, that someone says enough, or both sides say enough. Great. That was wonderful. I'm not going to let you get away without one final question here. <laughs> No one's asked you about the outcome of the election. I can't believe that. <laughs> Why don't you get a little political? Okay. I mean, with your with your experience in the House and uh, your continued conversations with what's going on, it's uh, November seventh, and uh, you've got your crystal ball. What's going to be a uh, newspaper headline? Can I answer with the caveat that something could happen tomorrow to change my mind? Is that okay? We all agree. On, we all agree. Yeah, you know, the president could have tweeted while we were all sitting here. This, this all could be for naught. You know. Um, uh, you know. Listen, I think um, record midterm turnout. Republicans maintain the majority in the Senate, narrowly uh, lose a majority. If, 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 if I had to, if, if you made me pen a headline today, um, uh, tomorrow that could change. I mean, it is a very, very fluid election cycle, um, and I, you know, I, I find it difficult to say what's going to happen 
as evidenced by the fact that the polls are all over the place for the reasons we cited earlier. Um, let me give you a one slight better answer to that. What should we want the headline to be, irrespective of who wins? And you know, that's what we try to spend a lot of our time thinking about. Maybe it's not the November 7th headline, but the November 8th headline should be, there's a renewed commitment to pursuing uh, immigration reform, skilled workforce, and making a down payment on our infrastructure needs. And the president and the new Congress have come together to figure out how to make those things happen. Now, I'm not betting on that, <laughs> um, but you know, listen, we're we're, we're 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 chamber folks and we're chamber members. Um, we we do this because we need to create those kind of headlines, and uh, that's what we're going to work to try to do. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.